With the pandemic, most of us cut down a lot on whatever travel we were doing. Journeys became few and far between. And when we did travel, it was maybe to some place close by. Now imagine going to the edge of space and back. Well, today we're meeting a young woman who did just that. Sirisha Bendla is Vice President of Government Affairs and Research Ops at Virgin Galactic. And about a year ago, she went right up there on the Virgin Galactic Unity 22 test flight with Sir Richard Branson and for others beating Elon Musk in the journey to get up there in their own craft. And we'll be talking to her about her journey there and back. Okay. And we'll start right there. It's a question we're often told, you don't ask people, but how did it feel when you were up there in space, looking down, looking around? What was that feeling? Oh my goodness, I, it, I always, you know, I, I reflect back and I keep coming back to the word incredible and amazing and I just cannot describe it any other way. It's really an, an emotional feeling, almost a mental state um, that's very, it's hard to describe, which is why I can't wait till more and more people are able to experience this very transformative journey. And to be honest, I can't, cannot wait until there's poets and professional communicators that go into space and come back and are able to just talk about the experience much more eloquently than an engineer could. But I, I'm sure it must have just, well, was it life changing? Did you feel different? You know, I didn't feel different, but you know, looking out on, on the earth and seeing the thin blue line of the atmosphere really put into perspective how lucky we are and how fragile our planet is. And it was incredible to see the, you know, I was looking out at the southwestern part of the United States. We talk about the states, but I saw no borders. And it put into perspective how divided we've become, yes, yes. you know, and seeing the brilliant earth just against, you know, the matte black and void of space just made it, made me feel small, but it didn't make me feel insignificant. So I returned back to the planet energized, really energized to pursue, you know, positive change for good and really appreciating what we have. Absolutely. The divisions are meaningless when we're just a little blue speck in space, yeah. which is absolutely <laughs> meaningless. Wow, yeah. it must have been absolutely fantastic. It was, it was absolutely incredible, and I, can't, I cannot wait to share it with so many more people. I, I, I truly believe, I know this is going to sound a little mushy, but I truly believe the more people that have seen that view, will, I, I think it will have a profound downstream effect on being kind to each other, respecting our planet, and I, I think you'll see that as we send, send more and more people to space. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, of course, we're claiming you, Indian origin woman, we, you are ours, and you're the third, like I was saying, after Kalpana Chawla and Sunita Williams. They must have crossed your mind when you knew you were going on this trip, when you were preparing for this trip. Two very different stories. How, how, what are your thoughts about them before you went up? You know, I have wanted to be an astronaut since I was young, and I was studying the careers of the Apollo astronauts and those that stepped foot on the moon. And, not, you know, as much as I, I, I respect what they did, they're definitely pioneers. You know, it didn't really feel, you know, I didn't connect with their journey. It, it felt so different than what I was, you know, my journey and my identity. And it really wasn't until I saw Dr. Kalpanya Chawla where I saw a woman, an incredible woman, a pioneer that I shared an identity with, yes, where yes. I saw that becoming an astronaut wasn't just a dream, it could be a goal that is attainable. So I was, you know, they've had, I've never met Dr. Kalpanya Chawla, but, you know, she's had such a profound effect on my life and my career. And, uh, you know, I hopefully I am, you know, my journey puts that same perspective for so many other people where they can share an identity and see a journey for themselves. Absolutely. So many little girls dreaming of space know that one day. One day. Yeah. And it, it, it's interesting because it really is a mental barrier. It's not yeah. that that wasn't a physical barrier there keeping me from pursuing being an astronaut, but something about seeing someone I could actually see myself in their shoes just made it so much easier for me. That's what representation is really all about. When you see somebody who looks like you going there. Yes. You yes. know it's possible. Yes, absolutely. It's, they showed it was possible. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And what were the preparations you had to make? Because of course, it's not catching a bus. It's not hailing an auto. You went up there. You had time in zero gravity. What were the preparations you had to make physical and mental for this journey? 
Yeah, and that's actually the best thing about Virgin Galactic. We have a training program built into the entire experience. So for myself, um, myself and my crew, we were on this flight to do a job. We were checking out the interiors. Yes. I was doing an experiment. So we had very intricate choreography throughout the cabin. So we started training about two months ahead of the flight. Um, part of it was going on a parabolic flight and experiencing microgravity and making sure we knew and were comfortable moving around in were microgravity. You yes, I'm made for zero You're G. You're made for zero G, okay. I am, I, I am made for floating around. <laughs> so it does I, sound good. It was amazing. Like, I love it. It's my environment. So we did the parabolic flight, did zero G, right. um, and then Colin and I, my crewmate, uh, got together. We have a mock-up in our facility where yeah. it's just basically the interior cabin where we practiced our choreography. We had our flight suits. We got to know all of the operational procedures. But another part you actually mentioned was the mental preparation. And part of our training is that. You've got the physical preparation, the operational preparation, but there's also a mental aspect for preparing yourself for that transformational journey. And we were able to talk to people that have gone through the experience before. We were able to sit down with teammates uh, at Virgin Galactic and talk about what this journey actually meant for us. Okay. And sitting down, actually expending time in, you know, the hectic, the, you know, every day is hectic. Yes. Yes. But carving out time to write it out, talk about what your goals are, what this means for you, really, really helped me prepare, help prepare me emotionally and mentally for this. Now, ticket sales have begun for people to become future astronauts. Yes. What will they be able to experience? If they do buy this ticket, get on this ride, get all the preparation done, what will they be able to experience? Yeah, I'm, ugh, I'm so excited to share this experience with so many more people. Um, a lot of people think the journey starts when you take off from the runway, okay, okay. but the journey actually starts when you decide you want to become a future astronaut with Virgin Galactic. And you know, ver as a Virgin business, we value the customer experience. It's one of, it's our product. And as soon as you decide you want to become a future astronaut with Virgin Galactic, you're taken in with the team, you're introduced to the community with people that are also going to okay, space okay. to talk about each, per each person's personal journey. And um, you'll have that communication with the team How until long you fly. Is this process? So it depends on when you decide to, um, as soon as you decide to buy a ticket, you're, in, you're introduced into the community. When you're about to go to space, um, you'll arrive about five days ahead of time and you'll okay. have five days of training before taking the, the space flight. And then of course the actual experience. And then uh, the actual experience, which is uh, you know incredible. It's 90 minutes. Yeah. Um, so you take off from a runway like you would mm -hmm. on a normal airliner. And during the climb up, you have time to talk to your crewmates. Um, if you're a researcher okay. or a scientist, you have some time to do some final preparations. Mm -hmm. And then you have the release. Um, after all the safety checks, they release the spacecraft from the, the mothership and you have a few seconds of free fall <laughs> and then the rocket motor lights and you have 60 seconds of boost. And as an aerospace engineer, I mean, we talk about the microgravity portion, the view of Earth, but that boost phase where I had the power of the rocket motor behind me and I can see in my window the sky that I've looked up at every day, the blue sky transitioning into the black space, blackness of space was just it's an incredible moment that's been etched into my memory. And people who want to be space tourists, who want to go up there, do they have to be supremely fit? No, so that is part of opening space up for all is, you know, I, I, my journey was because, you know, I wanted to be a NASA astronaut, but I was disqualified because of my eyesight. Um, so I chose at that point the non-traditional route of going through commercial space, but commercial space is becoming the norm. It's becoming the method that we all use for space travel. And part of opening space up for all is not to put limitations on who can go. So you don't have to be a young gym rat with zero body fat. I'm not a young gym rat with zero body fat. So no, you do not need to. That is good to know. But you've talked about the excitement of going up, but is space tourism really going to be a reality. What is the current cost for this experience with Virgin Galactic? So Virgin Galactic's tickets are $450,000. We have over 800 people signed up. Wow. Um, and really, you look at the market, there's multiple multiple companies offering space tourism experiences. Mm -hmm. And, you know, competition is great. It shows that there is a healthy market out okay. there. And yeah, so, uh, you know, as we build out our fleet, we have two spaceships. Um, one's about to go into flight test. The other one's completing his flight test. 
We're going to build more spaceships, more motherships, um, reach a flight cadence of 400 flights. Okay. And as we reach that scale, we hope to see the, the price of it come down come as well. Down from $450,000, which is not everybody has that in their back pocket. So yeah. that, it's still quite a lot. Yes, but you've yeah. got 800 people signed up for that already. Okay. And you do think costs will go down? Yeah, as we scale, I, yeah. I see the, you know, the hope is that the, all of the costs will come down. And, okay. you know, one other portion of the access to space mm. is also on the science and research side. Yes. So uh, for scientists and researchers, this is an opportunity that they don't get. Typically, yeah. You, yeah. you have a payload, a research experiment, yes. and you take it to an agency, ESRO, yeah. ESA, yeah. NASA, and they'll send it up to space and you collect the data. But now with suborbital systems, a researcher can conduct field research you can in space. You can go with your experiment. You said you had conducted an experiment there when yes. you went to this. <laughs> yes, yeah. So I had taken up um, plants, plants. Okay. and basically they were genetically modified to express certain genes okay. in response to the environment. So we were looking at which genes were expressed in microgravity, okay. in high G, okay. and also comparing it to 1G so that okay. in the future when astronauts take trips to the moon, to Mars, they'll have fresh food. But also what we've learned from that data being collected is that you can help um, people on Earth find um, air communities that are hit hard by climate change or you know, provide plants, um, agriculture that's sustainable and can provide food security for communities. That's fascinating. So going up, it's not just about looking out of the window and gasping at the view. Yep. It's also scientific, even for organizations who want to spend that almost half a million dollars to go up. Yeah, There's also that market. You know, half a million, I know it sounds, it, it is expensive but it's actually a fraction of the cost of alternatives. Going to orbit is mm. much more expensive. So for someone that needs that microgravity environment okay. to conduct research, okay. it's, it's a good deal. It's a steal. <laughs> it's, a, it's a steal. It's and, a bargain. <laughs> yeah. So far you're talking about people, whether it's tourists or whether it's people conducting an experiment. Is the business, is the business model all about taking people up for Virgin Galactic? Is that, is that how? Yeah, people and um, research and scientific. Yes. Uh, payloads. Uh, we've had a lot of the community want okay. to use our vehicle yeah. for iterating technologies, so testing technologies in a microgravity environment before they put it out into the field. So it's been uh, people for tourism purposes, okay. people for research purposes, and also payloads that run by themselves. Other private space aerospace companies also launch satellites. Are you doing that? Do you plan to do that? No, not at this moment. We are focusing on scaling up our suborbital system okay. and our suborbital business. So right now it's people. People, yep, and research payloads, of course. Okay. <laughs> now, as I mentioned earlier, there was that race between the billionaires, Richard Branson and Elon Musk, to actually get up there in their own craft. Mm -hmm. Richard Branson won this one. <laughs> what was the feeling like in the company at that stage? I mean, I think it was a, it was a good win for everybody. I mean, it, and it wasn't that Richard Branson was first. Mm -hmm. It's a milestone for the company that we were able to send people to space um, in the cabin because we're a human space flight. Galactic is a human space flight company. No matter if it's a test flight or a flight with yeah. customers, there's always two pilots. So, uh, you know, I don't really like the term race because for, for us, we weren't racing. We weren't going to do anything if okay. we weren't ready because we know we know the value of the human life. You know the value of the team and processes and put safety as our foundation of our culture and i know people think it's not fast enough but we're not going to do anything we're not ready better to not. do better not so rush out there it was really a coincidence on timing that we flew in july and okay. then you know the other companies flew afterwards okay all right and i can't help but ask richard branson this larger than life multi-billionaire what is he like he, he's such a good guy. <laughs> a good guy. He's a great guy. But you know, the, the, what I've I've learned so much from being one of his crewmates. He is a customer experience architect. He's done it successfully in so many of his companies. So his um, being on the flight, providing feedback, oh, taking okay. the first trip, so that he can experience it and then pass it on to all of the customers after him was was a great data point for us. So the whole airline experience and all that would have. Yeah, you know, hotel experience, everything, yeah. you know, Richard is the, the king of hospitality. And, you know, what we're providing, of course, is a space yeah. flight, but it's, it's a customer experience. And of course, comparisons are inevitable. Yep. Between <laughs> Branson and Elon Musk. How would you compare and contrast the two men and their styles of working from what you've seen, of course, from the outside? Yeah, I mean, what I've seen from the outside, it's, it's 
Every product is different. I mean, R Richard and Virgin Galactic especially are focusing on a holistic customer experience journey um, that starts again well before the vehicle goes okay. starts on the runway um, you know SpaceX Elon Musk is his his focus is to get humans to be a multi-planetary species he is working on um, vehicles that will get us to Mars and that will settle us in Mars so it's, it's really different products um, but uh, you know again competition is very healthy in the marketplace competition that's what I wanted to ask is yeah. there much overlap between what you and SpaceX do Virgin Galactic and SpaceX or is there much competition there how uh, not really so we focus on the suborbital journey um, for space tourism purposes yeah. SpaceX has been doing satellite launches to date and has been um, a contractor for NASA for a lot of their missions so not too much but honestly I mean okay. the space community we, we all especially on the policy side work together to create pol policies that are conducive to innovation okay. and um, a private sector uh, capabilities that can supplement government capabilities. So you might lobby together when it's a common cause. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> now, we've been to space and back. I'm going back to the beginning. Yep. You're a Guntur girl. Yep. You, you're from Andhra Pradesh. What was the journey like? You were there for the first five years of your life yep. in small towns, I'm guessing, in yeah. to up there. You know, I was born in Chirala and um, one of my earliest memories is during one of the you know, power outages, one of the blackouts, and I remember sleeping on my uh, grandfather's and my grandmother's rooftop. Yeah. And you know, you know, the stars, I don't remember ever seeing stars so bright. When there's no light pollution, they just almost seem like they're laying on your face. And I think that was really what first wow. planted the seed, seeing the stars in India so bright it made me curious you know what's out there and I, I wanted to be among them <laughs> you said you had the dream from the time you were a little girl yeah and I so I don't really know when I decided I wanted to be an astronaut but I, I do remember this memory of when I wanted to start exploring what's out there what would you like to say to other little girls and boys who have that dream what would you like to say to them if they're sitting there looking at the night sky and thinking someday I mean I, I my biggest advice is to you know center yourself and follow your passion because there's going to be ups and downs in every path you choose but if you bring yourself back to what drives you and you know what what your goal is it's going to take you through you know the ups and the downs and everyone's journey is different you know i definitely looked at you know the the pioneers before me to give me my first steps but it took, you know, charting out my own path to get to where i need and i i just want to say everyone's journey is going to be different um, don't think that, don't compare yourself. It's not a failure if you don't do the same thing as the person next to you. And you're going to have a brilliant journey regardless. Every journey is individual. Yes. Like you said, you didn't go the NASA route. But uh, yeah. you still made it to space. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, we have, of course, in India, so many thousands and thousands of science graduates, engineering students. Do you see a growth in the number of women coming into STEM, coming into science, technology, engineering and maths? Or do you still yeah. think there is some kind of mind block. I, I do see a growth and I, it's due to representation like Dr. Kalpanya Chawla and Sunita Williams and you know Dr. Swati Mohan like calling out okay. from the Mars rover you know I, I think that kind of repre representation yes, is yes. allowing um, young women to see themselves in this industry when they didn't think it was a, a opportunity before but just like everything else, there's still a lot of work to do. Um, and I, another piece of advice is always to find a mentor um, that's navigated some of the struggles before you that can help you navigate um, some of the, the things that will come your way because it's, there's still a lot of work to do in that, in that area. And finally, if you get a chance, are you ready to go again? Oh, yeah, uh, absolutely. That's actually, so I got off the spacecraft the first thing that happened was my I saw my dad, he gave me the biggest hug. Oh. And then the second thing, I saw um, my CEO and I said, wow, let me do, let's go again. <laughs> <laughs> when do I go on next? Yep, <laughs> I, sign me up, I'm, I'm ready. <laughs> Thank you so much for talking to us today. Thank you. So that young Indian woman you saw on that very first flight with Richard Branson going to the edge of space and back, she was with us here today. Sirisha, thank you so much for that lovely conversation. And I hope lots of young girls and boys feel that they can also do this wherever they are right now. Thank you for joining us today on NDTV.